Welcome to A Walk in My Stilettos, where our goal is to help you walk in your greatness. I'm your host, McKinney Smith. Hey, Faith Walkers. Thank you for joining us on the A Walk in My Stilettos podcast, where we have conversations with amazing women that are letting us step into their shoes. I help women to strengthen their resilience muscle, to own their stories and conquer their fears so they can reach their goals. I get inspired when I see another woman succeeding, but what interests me more is her backstory and her mindset on how she got there. So today's guest is about to bless us with her testimony. And since you're already here, you may as well subscribe. Today we have Andrea Henry. She's a single mother of three, cancer survivor, and a lawyer with more than a decade of experience working with businesses of all sizes and at every stage of the entrepreneurial journey. Henry Business Law provides the peace of mind that comes with proactive legal protection. When she started her firm, she had $1,000, three clients, and a lot of hustle and growing her business to six figures in under a year. She's also the founder of The Startup to help women-owned small businesses and startups get the protection they need to become wildly successful. Please welcome to the show, Andrea Henry. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and share your story with us. I guess first things first, your name, Andrea. Before I even go into my icebreaker question, so I'm not sure if you're aware, but my sister, who is very dear to my heart, who passed away in 2012, her name is Andrea. So anyone with the name of Andrea holds a special place in my heart. So I just wanted to start by letting you know, but how chilling this is for you to come on and to just share your truth and your wisdom. So I just want to thank you again. Thank you. I did not know that, but but thank you for sharing it. Yeah, no problem. So I love to start the show with an icebreaker question because I believe that as women, we have all of these different titles that we go by. And I feel that a title that's not given enough significance is our name because our names have meaning. And when someone is saying your name, they're declaring or affirming that meaning to you. So I would love to know, Andrea, do you know what your name means? It means womanly. Mm. Awesome. I love it. I love it. You know how uh, when you Google different meanings of a name from different origins or what have you, well, for example, growing up, my parents told me that my name meant beautiful one. And obviously I I believe them and I let that swell my head. And every time someone said, what does your name mean? I'm like, beautiful one. But anyway, (laughs) as I became an adult (laughs) and I started to do more research and dig deeper, I found out that in Swahili, it means strength of character. So I wanted to do some extra digging because, like I said, the name Andrea is important to me. And yes, I did see the same meaning that you just stated. And I also seen in in French, it it means brave. And in, I believe, the the biblical meaning, it's a courageous warrior. So I just wanted to affirm all of those things to you so that every time someone says your name, you know that that's what they're declaring. I love that. I'm here making notes. <laughs> so you you are a brave, courageous warrior. Wonderful. Yeah, I like that even better than the womanly and feminine. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to know, what did you want to be when you were a little girl? Oh my goodness. I wanted to be an anthropologist. I oh, was wow. really fascinated with culture. And my mom, I used to read, my mom had to do some anthropology courses as part of her degree from like the 1970s. And she had brought them home and I would read like Marvel and Margaret Mead books. And then as I got older and it became time to, to choose a career, I was like, I don't actually know any anthropologists. And <laughs> <laughs> a lot of what I knew about them was, okay, you'll go somewhere and you'll study, you know, civilizations. But a lot of it was people going to the jungle. And I am not, anyone who knows me knows I'm not a rough in it type of girl. Mm-hmm. I hate bugs. I don't know how I managed to grow up in the Caribbean with a lot of fear. And, um, and so I thought, maybe going to the jungle <laughs> is not really the best thing for me. I now know that there's so many different things that anthropologists could do. But at the time, that was my, that was my image of it. And so... I did a career test at school and it came back with 
journalist, counselor, and lawyer. Mm. Journalist, again, I was like, they're going to send me into a war zone. I'm going to have to sleep outside. No, not. (laughs) (laughs) So I didn't have anyone to ask about it. And, you know, for a lot of years growing up, people had said, you like to talk and you like to read and you like, I used to be very argumentative when I was younger, not anymore, but I used to be quite argumentative. Um, and so <laughs> like, go to law. Those, those things seem like they would serve you well um, in that field. So it wasn't like a really long, you know, drawn out, thought out situation. It was, okay, this seems to match my, um, my skill set and, and off I went. Wow. So What's funny when you say that, you know, you like to talk a lot and you used to be argumentative. So as you said that, I was thinking of my sister, Andrea, and my mom used to say, like, <laughs> she was my lawyer. <laughs> because, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> because she would, right? She would always defend me and speak on my behalf. And, yeah. you know, up until she passed, she was my voice. She spoke for me. And if I had a dispute with anyone, if I needed to return something at a store and I did not have the guts to do so, she would go and do so for me and speak on my behalf to make sure that I was being defended and <laughs> that I got the best side of the deal. <laughs> it must definitely be the same. That was what I was known. I grew up as an only child, but all of my friends, like I was the spokesperson for the group in any situation. So yeah, must be the same. That's great, awesome. Great <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So share with us what inspired you to start your online law firm? Oh my goodness. So that's a lot of backstory. <laughs> the, the short answer is I have three children and a single mom of three. And I really wanted to be able to spend more time with them and be more present with them. And when I started, like I talk about starting with a lot of hustle and it's true. I was very much go, go, go. I spent, you know, if I wasn't working, I was doing things with the kids. And I didn't spend a lot of time or any time really for myself. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the the journey behind that. But um, it became really important to me to carve out time to spend on on myself, to take care of myself, to have, you know, joyful times with my kids. And so I felt that going online would give me that flexibility as opposed to having to do everything in person. I cut out the commute. I cut out some of the still go to networking, but it, it allows more time to focus on what I really love to do, which in my, in my job is talking to people and com- communicating and connecting and educating. And I felt I could do that equally well and to a wider range of people virtually. Mm. I love that. And it's it's funny you say that because right now during this pandemic, I've been speaking to a lot of people who, um, for instance, are used to working their nine to five. And the fact that they're given the opportunity to work remotely and work from home, they're saying that they're so much less stressed because they're cutting out the commute and traffic. They're cutting out that extra travel time. They're cutting out all of the unnecessary stuff and they're able to focus on doing their job and then have that time to spend more time with their kids or to read or to do things uh, in terms of like self-care and even just to veg out and watch something on Netflix yeah. that they didn't have the opportunity before, but they're still doing their job or getting the job done. Sometimes even better, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, I, I believe in the power of personal connection and, and it's important to see people in, in person, but not having that extra stress makes a huge difference. And to the joy that you bring to your work as well, right? You're not complaining, you're not in a bad mood by the time you get to the office. You really can start your day in a much more productive way. Absolutely. I have, I guess, been blessed to have the opportunity to work for myself for the past 11 years. And (laughs) the last, I don't know, maybe since 2014, when I published my first book, that's where I shifted everything to virtually. And as much as I still, like you said, attended networking events or went and spoke on stages and places and still interacted face to face with people, being able to be fully productive and joyful uh, working virtually has been life-changing for me. Yes. And oftentimes people are like, oh my God, how are you able to stay so positive? And how are you able to be so, you know, this, that, and the third? And I'm thinking, well, I don't really have much of the stresses of the outside world. <laughs> I kind of live in my bubble of my home. <laughs> <laughs> 
listen, being in the bubble, people criticize it, but I think it's wonderful. I try to create as much of a bubble uh, of positivity as, as possible, right? I, I think there's nothing, <laughs> nothing mm-hmm. wrong right with that. The less, I guess, glamorous or the less uplifting reason is my family is originally from Barbados, and every time it gets cold up here, I go, wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> <laughs> And winters in Barbados. And so part of going online was like an experiment. Like, let's see if I can do this because not only will it help me kind of in my day to day, but you know, in a particularly February is the worst month. And right. I usually get to February and I'm just I'm so over it. You know, maybe I could go work for two weeks in Barbados in February. All of the the changes would be worth it if I could do that. So that's right. the less <laughs> Once outside opens back up, and I pray to God that you know travel recoups yes. quickly and in a safe way, but I am working towards that life where I can work from anywhere or be anywhere in the world. And technically, I kind of can already because I still coach clients and record <laughs> podcasts from any in the world. But still, I mean, you know, on a full time basis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did you come up with the concept of the startup? Oh, Secure Startup. So for years, clients had been coming to me often with contracts that they had kind of cobbled together, right? They'd gone online. And as I said, they copied and pasted their way to a contract. And quite often it was disastrous. <laughs> and, and, and the issue was when you just have these basic templates, there isn't any room for customization. There isn't any room really for you to understand what it is that you're signing and what it is that you're presenting to other people to sign. And so I had a client, well, she had a benefit from it, but the person that she had signed a contract with had gone onto one of these sites and had downloaded, you know, a $20 contract. And because of the nature of their business, really their competition would not have come from, from not soliciting employees, which is a, a, a common term, right? You see these things, don't solicit employees after you leave. Mm-hmm. The business didn't have any employees. It had independent contractors and authors. Mm. And so when people left, she wanted to stop them from working together. But her contract didn't allow for her to do that because she just downloaded the standard thing. She was mm. the person on the other side lost about half of their business because of not having the right clause. Right. And so for years, people were saying, yes, I understand it's better to work with a lawyer. But I'm, you know, I'm at the startup phase. There's five hands out for every dollar that comes in. I just am not in a position um, or I can't justify investing in these custom bespoke contracts. And so instead of complaining, which is really not helpful, right? I spent right. a little while doing that. Why are people doing this? This is so unhelpful. These are not good. And then eventually I just went, there's no point in complaining. Why not try to create something that addresses that need? Where right, find a solution. Find a solution, right? It's why the law firm started in the first place. That literally, um, when I started, I started with a business partner, and we would get together in Starbucks when I was on when I was um, I had just had my my third child, and we would just complain about former bosses and what we would do differently. And after a few months of that, I'm like, this is like, we should start. To, we should, you know, do all the things that we're seeing mm-hmm. in their situation. So it's the same thing with a secure startup. I wanted to provide that solution. I wanted people to be able to have something at the startup phase when there's not tons of money available to invest, but to have contracts that were really tailored to their particular industry, because that's important. An Mm -hmm. independent contractor agreement for someone who runs a spa is going to be different from a coach, is going to be different from an online entrepreneur. So for their industry, and that would also allow them to customize it. So I kind of say it's like my brain online right it's, mm-hmm. it's the process that i go through when i'm drafting a contract i'm teaching people how to do that with their own right wow okay so if for example if i want to partner with another woman in the woman empowerment space mm-hmm. and we want to collaborate on a project we would come to you to create a contract that's right okay so contracts are amazing, but contracts really are, you're an author. Contracts are a story. That is it, mm-hmm. right? It is a story of your, of what you want the relationship to be. 
So the same way when you're when you're writing a book, it has, you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, there are characters in the book, there's the storyline or the plot or the accounting of what happened. There's the same thing in a contract. So the two people or the three people or however many are in the relationship are the characters mm-hmm. and what it is that you expect to happen. So, you know, I am engaging you as a coach. What I expect to happen is you're going to provide the coaching services. It's going to increase my, you know, understanding of things or the way in which I run my business. And then you expect me to show up on time. You expect me to do my right. Home, right? right. Tell you. That's your expectation of the relationship. The only thing that makes contracts different from a normal story or a normal novel is that contracts have, I don't know if you remember, I'm dating myself a little bit, but the choose your adventure books where you Mm -hmm. can your own ending. Yes. In a way, a contract is like that because there's an alternative ending. So it's, these are the people, this is the character, this is the plot, this is what we expect to happen. But just in case it doesn't work out how we (laughs) thought, right? If one of us doesn't do what we're supposed to do, this is what happens. And and it sets out really clearly, look, these are things that you can and cannot do. And if you do this, this is going to be a problem for my business, on my life. And so you can't do it. And these are the consequences if you don't. But I find if you look at it as a story, it makes it less intense. Yeah. Like I've never heard of it put that way before. And I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. That makes it so much easier to even come up with the terms of a contract. Exactly. Because it's literally, I get asked all the time, can I put this in the contract? Can I put this in the contract? The answer 99% of the time is yes. The employment contracts are subject to legislation. So there's only so much you can go wrong with there. But pretty much for everything else, a contract is what you can get the other person to agree to, right? It's a story of a relationship, whatever that relationship is. Right. I love it. Okay. So what inspires you the most about what you do? It's seeing people and their businesses thrive and grow. To see a client go from, you know, an idea or being uncertain about going after a new opportunity and then seeing them really start to take their business seriously and get bigger opportunities and get bigger clients and be more visible. And they can do that because they have confidence, right? They can do that because now they know that they're protected. I think that's that's the most rewarding. My my mom, when I was growing up, my mom was a, a teacher, a school counseling teacher. And it felt to me at the time that she knew like everybody in Barbados. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every time I went out, like to go from something that should take a five minute walk would take an hour because every few steps she would stop to talk to someone who she, sure some of you have Caribbean mothers like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I remember one day I was around eight years old and um, she stopped to talk to this lady who looked about 20 years older than my mom. And they were chatting. I wasn't really paying attention. I was eight. I had my own stuff going on. But after my mom was saying, you know, that lady went to school with me. And I looked at her and looked at my mom. I was like, there's no way she went to school with her, right? And my mom said, no, 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 we were classmates. I'm like, she looks like she could be your mom. How? And she said, my mom said, I'll never forget this. She goes, that's what happens when you're not independent. Mm. Turns out that this lady hadn't really taken her school life seriously. She'd gotten into not great relationships where she was financially dependent. And people hadn't treated her well. And so for me, it's always been important in a relationship or out to be independent and to make sure that I can look after myself. And what I want for other women is that feeling as well. And I am somewhat evangelical about the belief that having a successful business is the best way to do that, right? Mm -hmm. We just talked earlier about being able to travel and being able to work from home and the flexibility that you have with a, with a profitable thriving business that is created to suit your life or the life that you want, like that freedom cannot be matched by anything. Right. So my job is to make sure that that beautiful thing that can give you the life that you want is. What advice would you give to a woman regarding risk proofing her life and business? Yes. So there are a lot of things you can do. The first thing is to learn how to assess risk, right? So I'm a big believer in brain dumps. 
anytime I'm getting too sort of cerebral and in my own head about things, I find it really helpful to just put everything down. So if I'm afraid of something, if there's an opportunity that I can't decide about or, you know, place in my business that I want to go, I'll write it all down and I'll write down all of the fears. What's the worst case scenario? Once you've got that on paper, generally speaking, you will stop panicking as much as you work because once you put it down, you realize it's <laughs> Right. And then you start working through, okay, if I'm worried about this, what are some things that I can put in place to make this risk less or make me more comfortable with the risk? So it may be, oh my goodness, if I leave, you know, if I leave my job to start my business, what happens if I get sick and now there's there's no money coming in? The answer to that might be insurance. That might be critical illness insurance, right? Um, or if you get disabled, the same type of thing. It may be, oh my goodness, I'm going to go online. I'm going to start selling these things. What if someone gets injured or gets hurt or by something that I'm doing and they sue me? I don't want to lose my house. Maybe the answer is incorporation. Maybe the answer is really good contracts with your clients and your customers. So it's really about sitting down and figuring out what are the areas in my life where there is a risk? And it's both business and personal, right? Because often, especially if we're solopreneurs, we don't have a big team when you're starting out. Mm -hmm. People have the business, right? If you are not able to do what it is that you do, there's no money coming in. Right. How do you prevent against that? And some of those are practical things, right? Some of them are, okay, if I'm the solopreneur and the business only exists when I'm working, one, not a great thing because ideally, so I'm all about making money while on the beach. You will see the beach come up in any <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, the ideal thing is to not have to exchange time for money all the time, right? Right. right. So maybe that's one of the things. If you say, look, if I am not literally in front of a computer or in front of my client, I'm not making any money. Maybe some of the risk management is I need to build a business that can work, at least to some extent, without me. Maybe I need leveraging. I need to leverage. I need to. In place so that other people can come and do what I do. So it's a holistic approach to your business. Certainly, there's a legal aspect of protecting yourself, there's an insurance aspect, but a lot of it is your mindset in terms of I want to do X. I, it's not about my job is not to tell you not to do X. Mm-hmm. My job is to help you understand what the risks are and how you can minimize it because I am all about feeling safe, right? I think businesses are risky. But it's not for me. I want to know that there's some safety, that I've baked in as much safety as possible for whatever it is that I'm going through. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tell us, what is one thing that most people don't know about Andrea? I'd like to say my life is an open book, at least recently. But one thing that people don't know about me. I met Prince Charles once. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Back up. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a lot of people who see me online now when I've you know got my brand in together, shout out to Miss Monique Bryan who tells me off all the time when I'm in sweatpants. But <laughs> I think not everyone knows the journey to get to this point, right? Right. And when my I'm trying to think of what year this was, 2014, I was seven months pregnant with my last child. And my husband decided to leave. And wow. Yeah. <laughs> Went back to his home country. And yeah, it was it was a really difficult time. And part of dealing with that was what I talked about earlier in terms of just really throwing myself into work. I was like, well, I don't want to be in a situation where I have to depend on anyone. I think when he left, I had maybe like two months expense to save and that was it. And I was seven months pregnant, so I couldn't go look for anything. Right. And, and so really being driven to be in a situation where I knew that I could look after myself and my children because I don't know if anyone else would be able to relate. I've never in my life had an issue with making money. The issue has been with keeping it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. So, but I really wanted to be in a situation where I was responsible for myself. And I threw myself into work um, when my daughter was just a few months old. I went back to get my master's in business and tax law and did that full time 
while dealing with you know, two older kids and a newborn and trying to start up the law firm. There was a lot of stuff going on. And for many years, that struggle and that feeling of I always have to be going and going and going was really, you know, part of my identity, right? Mm -hmm. And then early in 2018, I got diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. Wow. And that really completely changed my life. And I'm not, I'm not happy that I got it, but I am very grateful for a lot of the lessons um, that I learned through it. And so when it happened, I never got upset. I know this is going to sound really strange. And, and this is like everyone has their own journey and how people respond is very unique. But I never felt upset. I never felt upset at the cancer. I always viewed it as, okay, this is, this is the universe talking to me. And mm -hmm. I really have not been listening because I've just been like putting my head down and driving and, you know, not paying attention to anything else. And my old coach used to say to me, because well, some people are experiential learners, which is a really nice way of saying hard. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's and me. So, yeah. <laughs> so clearly me too, right? And, and this was kind of a sledgehammer of me to pay attention. And so since then, I've really prioritized self-care and really prioritize looking after myself and not feeling like I need to always be, like I don't even like the word hustle anymore, like feeling and trying to, to be more in alignment with where I want to go to be more flow with the universe. And when I first did that, it really was for health reasons. I was like, look, the sleep in three and four hours a night and always being on the go clearly has made me ill. I need to stop that. I need to take time to exercise. I need to take time to sleep. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. my first child was born. But the really interesting thing about it was the more time I spent on self-care, the more the business grew. Mm. Which I did not expect at all. When it first started, I was like, I'm doing this for my health. And if I make less money, so be it, right? But you can't spend it if you're dead. So it really was more of a health thing. Right. I'm pleasantly surprised. I was like, oh, you mean I didn't need to be killing myself? You mean it can be easy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean that I, I mean, I still work hard. I, I still work um, long hours, but I make sure that I carve out that time for myself. And I found that what became really important to me was listening to myself. I found for so long, you know, my body would tell me things where you, you get this little voice and I would ignore it because I just didn't have the time to, to be still enough to hear it. Right. Right. And so for me now, the key thing is getting still frequently enough that I can hear that voice, that I can get those nudges. And those have been the things that have moved the business forward more so than any, you know, I'm going to work a 20 hour day. Right. Um, even like the decision to go virtual, secure sort of all those things mm -hmm. that have made my business a joy for me and, who, and that have served people in such an awesome way. Really, like often it's when I'm in the shower, just <laughs> water <laughs> I get my soft eye days in the shower or like in, on the massage table. Um, but yeah, I would say that quite often, especially in our community, this idea of being superwoman and you have to look after the kids and you have to make sure your house looks a particular way. Food has to be a particular way. And you also have to kill it at work. And we don't spend any time for us. Right? Mm -hmm. And so besides all the legal things I've been talking about, if I, the thing that I want people to, to really hear is that, that you can look after yourself, you can prioritize your health, not just physical health, but emotional, mental, spiritual, and prioritize your health and still kill it in your business. Mm -hmm. First off, I'm sorry that you had to experience all of those things. And I can only imagine like from your husband leaving you when you're seven months pregnant to, you know, being diagnosed with breast cancer. I can, like, I'm sorry that you had to experience that, but hearing your mindset on how you've been able to come to this place of finding balance in your life to not only appreciate what the experience has taught you, 
but to show you the importance of self-care, but how you making self-care and balancing that out has led you to have a more thriving business. That's exactly right. I think that is so, so powerful in not only myself hearing that, because I too was one of those people that in the beginning, especially when I used to sell real estate, it was like you said, 20 hour days, you know, yeah. and I have three kids as well. So it was sending the kids yeah. off to school and working <laughs> yeah. all day and appointments and open houses and showing houses and doing research and putting kids to bed and going back on the computer and sending right. clients listings. And, right. <laughs> and that, that drained me and it caused me actually back to back fibromyalgia flare ups and my body shut down. And I too had to come to a place of putting self-care first and understanding that I need minimum seven hours sleep a night and that I need to eat healthier and that I need to be moving and that, you know, all of those things and setting boundaries so that I am taking care of me and seeing now how that has affected not only what I attract in business, but being able to feel like I'm doing well because our the body is an instrument of the mind. So everything that is happening in your mind, oftentimes we wonder, why do I feel sick? Or why am I, you know, why is this happening to me? If you actually take a look at what is happening in the mind and it goes back to even like psychology, when they look at brain scans and all of those things, if you are not taking care of yourself, if you are having unhealthy thoughts, if you are suppressing your emotions and you're causing depression, it's, it's how you're taking care of self if you want to be able to thrive in other areas of your life. So I think that it's so important that you've come to that aha moment and realize that on your own. Yes. And the thing is, ideally, it doesn't take fibromyalgia or cancer or anything else like that for people to wake up, right? Right. You, you come to that realization when you're still healthy and when right. you're in a great place to be able to. Um, to be able to change. You know, as Jamaicans would say, we're hard ears. <laughs> Which <laughs> translation is our ears yeah. are hard. We don't That's listen. It. We need to learn the hard way. <laughs> At the number of times I heard growing up, hard ears you want hear, one way you're going to feel. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to know, Andrea, what does your self-care routine look like? Oh my goodness. Okay, so... I get up around 5.30 in the morning and I do meditation and I do visualizations. I read from some type of positive um, you know, self-development book and then I'll try to move. So depending on how I feel, sometimes it might be a walk outside. I, I used to say jog, but really it's a very, it's a fast walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, or I might do like yoga in my room, but I'll do some type of movement in the morning. I'll have a gratitude practice. So first thing when I get up and also last thing before I go to bed, I write the three things that I'm most grateful for. And I find that that, um, the gratitude and the being still when everyone else is is still sleeping and I can be alone with my thoughts, Mm -hmm. makes a big difference into how my day um, plays out. And the few times when I'm not able to do it, like all kinds of... (laughs) Mm -hmm. Not go how I wanted it. Um, and even this morning, my daughter came in the middle of, of my visualization and we had a chat. I was like, yeah, if mommy doesn't do this, I'm not going to be a nice mommy. Or the mommy that doesn't yell at you and has fun with you is right. not take that time to be present with myself. If you stop me from doing that, by the time we get to six o'clock this evening, I'm not going to be as friendly as I usually am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, I have struggled almost all of my life with food and after cancer, I've been better at it. It's still a work in process, mm-hmm. but I, really, I worked with a nutritionist last year who really, it was such a simple statement, but it really changed the whole way I looked at it because I was complaining about all the things that I felt I couldn't eat. And it was like, she gave me the list of things that would be good for future health. And I was like, oh, I need that. And all this stuff that I like to <laughs> not a happy camper. And she said, I'd like you to view it not as an act of restriction, but as an act of self-love. Right. And I was like, oh, 
And do you see how perception changes everything? Right. And so that really, you know, is, as I said, still a work in progress, but that really has been a significant change in my relationship with food. Instead of viewing things that are not good for me as treats, I'm actually, this broccoli is, and I visualize it. I'm like, this is going into my cells and making my cells in perfect health. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and just really thinking about what I'm putting into my body is a way to express my love and care for myself, as opposed to it tastes really good for two seconds in my mouth, but it's not going to do me a world of good otherwise. Not going to fuel you. Perception is, is key. And it was funny because then after I could just decide not to eat stuff. And I said, oh, this is what all these slim people have been doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. So I've, I've had a few mindset clients that struggle with maintaining a, a healthy body weight. Yeah. And show up to their training, they will not eat what they're supposed to eat, and they will still complain that they haven't gotten rid of the weight that they want to get rid of. And I've had to make it very clear to them that it starts in your mind first. Because you can go to a personal trainer every single day for a month, but if your mind isn't right and you haven't come up with that healthy perception of not only what healthy weight looks like to you, but what you want for your life and how you view food and how you view exercise and how you view your own health, then you're just going to revert right back to your old habits because the mind is programmed to find anything that it loses. And most people will lose 20 pounds and gain back 25 because their mind is trying to find what it lost. They didn't deal with their head first. Yes. That's it. And it's, it's in so many different areas of life. Last year, I felt like I was having a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a breakdown, but I, I just needed some time away. And so I got up one morning and I was like, I need to be among trees. And my mother, who was with me at the time, went, huh? I'm like, I need to be around trees. I feel like I just need to be around trees. And I went on, on Airbnb and I looked and I found a yurt in the middle of um, somewhere out in East Ontario, like a thousand people in the town. And... I just felt like I needed to be around the street. So I, was like, I can't even explain. I thought I was losing my mind. She's like, why can't we just go to a hotel like a normal person? I'm like, because I need to be around trees. Anyway, so I went to be around trees. <laughs> I was in during that time, Jay Hendrix, the big leap. And that was another like life changing moment because that concept, I'm sure you've read it, and if it those of you who are listening, Gay Hendrix talks about an upper limit problem that we will say and consciously we want to have more success. We want to be at a healthy weight. We want to have great relationships. But subconsciously, we have a limit on the amount of success, on the amount of joy mm-hmm. we allow ourselves to have. Yep. And anytime time we get beyond that, even though consciously we're like, yeah, great, our subconscious pulls us back because it's like, this is not comfortable. Even though this is what you said you wanted. And even though the alternative doesn't feel great, it does feel comfortable. It feels familiar, Mm -hmm. familiar. And so we bring ourselves back down. And I had gone on this, I need to be around trees right after I'd had a peak, my highest month ever in my business. And I couldn't understand where it had come from. As far as I was concerned, I hadn't done anything different. I was the same messaging as usual. And I had an upper limit problem and I literally kind of froze for a week or two and did nothing. And I think that was my subconscious going, you made too much. It's unfamiliar. Let's bring mm-hmm. it back. Right. And I think it's the same thing with weight. Like if you don't really change your perception or, or the importance of health to you or being at a healthy weight, then whenever you lose, as you said, your mind's going to find a way to take you back to what is familiar even if it doesn't feel good. Yeah, that experience that you had, well, for one, when your mind was telling you that you need to be around trees, I don't know if you're familiar with the practice of grounding. It's like reconnecting with the earth because we're all energy, we're all spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had just gone to a regular hotel, like your mom said, you wouldn't have found any solace in that. Your, it's like your soul was seeking to reconnect, to ground yourself. Um, being around, touching, physically touching trees or physically standing in the grass barefoot 
or walking in the sand barefoot or being in the ocean, connecting with the water, all of those things, that's you're connecting with the energy and the spirit of mother nature of God. So it's you reconnecting to ground yourself. So you, you probably had that strong urge because of the unfamiliar and what you were talking about with your subconscious mind. So your, your conscious mind, that's, you know, your thinking mind, what we think, what we want to do and what we want to achieve, but your subconscious, your feeling mind, how we feel about being able to achieve those things is very different. So when I'm coaching my clients, it's helping them to shift their self image because we have two, we have the one on the outside, which is how you dress and how you do your makeup and how you walk and talk and show up to the outside world. But your self image that's on the inside of how we view ourselves in terms of what we feel we value in life or what we feel we're, we're worth it affects how we show up in the world. So when you had that really successful month in your business and things blew up inside, somewhere in your subconscious mind, because that's we're we're programmed to think the way that we do, there's something in there that says this doesn't, this doesn't connect, right? So you were desperately somewhere in your soul seeking (laughs) to find some way to ground things. And we're programmed for safety, right? Yes. So if anything that happens, our brain is automatically programmed to go back to what it what it knows. Just listening to your story, there's so many things in there that I wanted to unpack, but I actually wanted to go back to your self-care routine because I think there's so many things in there that are so important to reiterate mm-hmm. because your routine and your, I'm going to say your rhythm, like even when you were explaining to your daughter when she came in to talk to you, that if she throws you off, you know, that throws your entire rhythm off. And having these routines and these habits in place are what keep us being successful. And it's these small habits that compound to have a successful life. So you getting up early in the morning is important. You finding that time to meditate and to be still is majorly important. You making the time to read and to educate yourself is important. You finding the time for movement because healthy motion equals healthy emotion. Like our bodies, we need to keep it moving, right? And then practicing the gratitude. That is like to me, that's one of my biggest things on my list, hence why I have my prompted gratitude journal out there. But <laughs> it's so important actively practicing gratitude. We can say we're grateful for something, but when you actively take the time to write down the things that you're grateful for, you are consciously making that effort to think about what you appreciate in your life right now. That is what helps us to attract more things to be grateful for. And then you talking about your nutrition and how you had to switch your perspective of that in order to be more comfortable with the food that you eat. Like you had so many important things in there. I don't even know if you realize. (laughs) So I guess I would love to know because you have spoken throughout this conversation about types of mentors and coaching. So I don't even want to ask you if you've had any. I guess I want to know how has coaches and mentors played a role in your life? They have made a huge difference. So. My first business coach and mentor is a friend that we shared with who is now past, um, Kiki Lola. Mm-hmm. And she was instrumental in helping me to see the possibility of what my business could be. Mm-hmm. And looking outside what the traditional law firm looked like and being okay with my business being a reflection of who I was. Right. So that was really sort of groundbreaking um, in my mind. Like, oh, mm-hmm. I can create something for me. I don't have to just do it. <laughs> she opened up, yeah, she opened up your mind. She did that for a lot of people. Right, she completely opened up my mind. And then um, my second coach, when I got the, uh, when, I, when I started, I was working with a business partner, as I said, and um, we're still great friends, but we realized we weren't same page business wise, but I realized this really early and struggled with with making that decision. And the second coach said, I don't want to is a good enough reason. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm like, what? I mean I don't have to come up <laughs> literally I had to go lie down after she told me that. Like for so long, for all of my life, right? If I felt like doing something or I didn't feel like doing something and I couldn't justify it logically or if I felt it would hurt somebody else's feelings, I just felt like I couldn't give myself permission to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to and conversely, I want to is a good enough reason 
was like another, you know, that emoji with the like mind blown thing, yeah. literally. Um, and that has changed a lot about about how I run my life and, and how I run business. Because now I allow myself to be like, I want to do it, so I'll do it. Or I don't want to do it. And even if it makes financial sense on the outside to do it, or even if everyone thinks it's a good idea, I don't want to is a good enough reason. Absolutely. Um, it's the reason why I went to go in the middle of the forest in the year. Even though I couldn't logically justify what was going on, I've learned to listen to myself. And my body said, I want you to go do this. And I was like, okay, cool. I want to do it. So I don't know why I want to do it. You've now explained to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in my house, I was like, oh, that's what I was doing. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just knew what I wanted to do and allowing myself to do the things that I want to do and not do the things that I don't want to do has been, has been really amazing. And it's interesting because my dad is an entrepreneur as well. And I've invested a lot in coaches over the years. And he's kind of an old school entrepreneur. He's like, money. <laughs> that money should go into it. <laughs> you should, or you should you know, you know, invest in other stuff. And, and, you know, there's a time and a place for, for different types of investments. But I honestly feel that where I am now in my business and in my life is a direct result of investing in, in coaches. Um, mm. right in it. Like I never was like, I just want to wait until I have the money. No, I think the first, like the first long-term coach that I had, I have to borrow. I had borrowed money to pay for services. Mm-hmm. Well. Figure it out. But you made an investment into yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's cool better to make an investment into than yourself. Right. Yeah. Wow. That is so, that is so important on so many different levels. So I have a completely random question. Uh, I love to ask every woman that comes on the show this question. And so far it's been on point. So let's see where it takes us today. (laughs) But there's this article that I came across on Reader's Digest. And it basically says that your favorite, it it explains what your favorite type of shoe says about your personality. I would love to know, Andrea, what is your favorite type of shoe? Is it like a high heel boot, a running shoe, a walking shoe, a flip-flop, a stiletto, pump a mule a wedge a work boot i don't know what's your favorite type of shoe i like leopard print high heel would that be more I under flashy it. stilettos or pump yeah. yeah i guess flashy yeah leopard is really flashy <laughs> <laughs> so women in flashy stilettos work hard and have excellent taste Women who wear flashy stilettos like Jimmy Choo's and Christian Louboutins or other heels inspired by inspired by their aesthetics may seem materialistic, but these women are actually incredibly hardworking. They have major drive and determination and standout work ethic. This is someone who says yes before she says no. She's very willing and very open to possibilities. She also really loves and values beauty. So she surrounds herself with beauty, whether it be things, people, or how she lives. It doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be pleasing to the eye. You will walk in and go, oh, wow, what a lovely room. Or this is so inviting. She has a knack for being able to create an aesthetically pleasing space. Yeah, I think that's pretty on on point. (laughs) (laughs) Is sometimes suffers because of my three children who don't share the same <laughs> but, um Yeah, I, I think that's pretty on point. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so tell the people where they can stay connected with you online before we go to the final segment. I tend to hang out mostly on IG at Henry Business Law. Um, I'm also online, henrybusinesslaw.com. Henry Business Law, just to... <laughs> awesome, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, and also the securestartup.ca for their um, for the done for you legal template. Perfect. I will definitely have the link so they can connect with you in the details section of your episode so they don't have to search too far. Awesome. And for the final segment of the show, I call it a walk in her wisdom where it's just a couple reflection questions and you share the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Name a book that has changed or greatly impacted your life. Big leap. Gay Hendricks. So the whole thing with the right. problem and, and the whole, the four quadrants of, uh, Zone of incompetence, competence, excellence, and genius, and trying to spend most of your time in your zone of genius. I need to read that. Okay. If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say and why? I'd have a billboard <laughs> in Bridgetown Barbados 
<laughs> say, mama, I made it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. What new belief, behavior, or habit has improved your life in the last five years? It's okay to listen to myself. Mm. It's okay to trust myself. Love it. What have you become better at saying no to in the last five years? And that could be distractions, invitations, family. Toxic relationships. Mm. Amen to that one. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Last but not least, Mm -hmm. how has being a mother changed you? I really felt... Can I give a longer answer? Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) So I've always been, I want to show you how this makes sense later, but starting way back, I've always been this really, really good student. Always loved studying, loved school, excelled in school. And growing up, my focus was I wanted to earn a scholarship for university. I worked and I worked and I worked and I got it. And I hadn't really thought past that a whole lot, right? Everything was building up to this point where I was going to go to this really good university and I got in and I was really happy. And then I graduated and it was kind of a, well, now what, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> really thought about like what my life was going to look like um, after that. The other thing is um, my parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. I grew up as a witness. And that religion talk is very focused on the end of the world. And so growing up, I was taught, you know, oh, it's unlikely that you're going to, you're going to be in this system um, once you graduate. And so I really hadn't made a lot of preparations for after school, mm. which means even though I was a good student and graduated with good grades from a good university, all the rest of it, I was kind of aimless. I mean, it was like whoever, you know, convinced me most recently is the path that I would go. And when I had my first child, that changed because suddenly I had a really clear, concrete purpose. Mm. And it was like, I cannot be aimless anymore. I cannot just kind of go where the wind takes me because this little person is entirely dependent on me and my ability to make you know, as good decisions as I can. Mm-hmm. So I think I started to take life a lot more seriously. I started to think more about the future. And it really has been, um, you know, the driving force behind most of what I do is my children. It's how I run my business is in a way to be more present with them, but also to be able to provide them with some of the things that having a successful business can afford, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it was really, it was really life changing, and it it happened like that. It was funny because I was, um, I don't know if you had this experience. All the time that I was pregnant with my first child, I had a wonderful pregnancy. Like I actually love being pregnant. It's, it's the reason of the children that's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> that part, no. But <laughs> pregnancy itself was fine. I was running up and down stairs for like forty weeks, but it was really funny when I was in labor. Right before when the doctor, you know, told me to start pushing, I was like, I'm actually going to have a child. I think like it actually hit home then. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment of brief panic, like, I'm not ready to have a child. (laughs) 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 That's funny. (laughs) I was like, the realization, the panic, and then he was here. Um, But yeah, in that moment, I was like, okay. I have to take things more seriously. You know, even even the self-care, even though it is about self and it's about making sure that I'm okay, that relates back to the kids as well because I'm like, I have to look after myself so I'm there for them. Right. Right? If I'm not here, if mama's not happy, if mama's not healthy, no one is going to benefit. Right. Yeah. That has made a big difference. Wow. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Honestly, I love that. And I love that you share the story of your upbringing and your background and your belief and how it, you know, falls into how motherhood has changed you into living a life of more purpose. Wow. I mean, I've asked a few women that question and I believe everyone has pretty much said that 
becoming a mother has changed their life for the positive and has made them look at how they want to be as a person and the legacy that they want to leave behind. Yes. But I, I love that you've given some backstory to that of where your belief or prior belief came from. Well, <laughs> thank you, Andrea, for taking the time to join us. I truly appreciate you sharing your story with us. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. No, no problem. And to all of you faith walkers out there, until next time, subscribe on all platforms and rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Join the community of faith walkers and sign up for our weekly newsletter at awalkinmystilettos.com. And be sure to grab one of my personal development books available online everywhere. And if you can think of one person that would receive value from Andrea's testimony, please share it with them. And don't forget, you can screenshot this week's episode and tag us on Instagram. Andrea is at Henry Business Law, and you can tag myself at The Real McKinney Smith and continue to walk in greatness in your stilettos in a manner worthy of your calling. <laughs>